Hello and welcome back. I'm Shelf Unit, and this is my continuing let's play of Under Rail. So last time we unlocked more things. I've got to go to Abyssal Station Zero, but I've also discovered functional. Oh, apparently, I now discovered that functional naval mines. I didn't realise I had to had to speak to them there. And I've investigated the Joint Security Ho coordinates, and I've just got to. Yeah, recovering any equipment. So we also needed to go up to here and recovered MPC data. So, Jarlisman, genetically engineered animals, article for Lemurian, Lemurian Intelligencer. Last month's edition featured a wonderful article on the cultivation and genetic engineering of plants, Crimson Meadows by Benedict Osborne. This article prompted me to write my own as a follow-up, missing the basic philosophy of ecological development and NFT, and by extension, us Lemurians have undertaken. The difference is that I will be focusing primarily on the animal kingdom. Natural environment is a term missing, denotes an environment that encompasses all living and non living things that occur and interact naturally. Without intervention excuse me, from outside forces like human beings, Lemuria used to be a fully natural environment before our arrival. Living inhabitants, which were for a while, while far more diverse than our foreparents had anticipated, still much less numerous and less varied the world from which they came. If I pause, assume that the text is missing if for some reason you're not watching. Fish and fungi were abundant and arthropods and smaller mammals, but large terrestrial animals and plants in general, on which Osborne elaborated, were barring a few exceptions, a thing of the past. It was a healthy ecosystem, no question, but it was clear then, clearer now, that there was no there was room for improvement. For it is our duty to develop the environments which we inhabit populate them with life. Not only human, also our duty to, in to cease our intervention as soon as we've added, aided nature sufficiently, because a healthy ecosystem must be self-sustaining. We, the Lemurian Agriculture Committee, have a long-term plan for the rejuvenation of the animal kingdom of Lemuria, the basic premise, through means of genetic engineering, fixed number of selected species which would then be released into the wild and continue evolving through natural mechanisms, as opposed to hitherto artificial ones. These base animal f families would then further evolve and branch out into other species. The fundamental idea was to introduce into the environment all elements deemed necessary. The plan also included an important clause, reduction of reproductive cycles in all engineered species of animals as much as possible whilst also engineering their DNA in such a way to boost mutation rates in a controlled manner and within certain limits, for great care must be taken when speed up the whole process greatly. I will now elaborate further on, point, on both of these important points. The reproductive cycle is essentially what determines the speed at which evolution occurs, since only through conception, through merging of gametes, reproductive cells, and therefore their chromosomes, do we get an actual new organism with a different set of traits. But that alone is insufficient. We already have species with incredibly short reproductive cycles, like small insects, and they do not differentiate very fast. Environmental factors are also important, but that means we've natural selection. There is an important step before we can reach any of that. Mutation rate. Mutation is the primary driving force behind evolution. Natural or artificial selection do not create new species. They merely select them, determining whether organisms survive and reproduce. Mutation is what causes changes in the cell's DNA. And these changes could, if not deleterious, result in a healthy creature different traits. Mutations can arise in many different ways, from radiation or chemical damage, erroneous DNA repair, but these somatic or acquired mutations do not necessarily become hereditary mutations, also called germline mutations, and can be deleterious to a living creature, giving rise to diseases such as cancer or Mutation rates differ between species, as well as between different regions of the genome. Therefore, task our genetic engineers is to modify the base family's DNA, is to fine-tune mutation rates, control hypermutation, specific segments of the genome, to increase the probability for mutations which are more likely to benefit the creature, increasing the heredi her heritability and decreasing the possible probability for deleterious mutations to occur. This is important. 
faster reproduction of animals more susceptible to mutations work exponentially to their benefit. Natural selection will take over from that point. Life will expand and diversify faster than it ever could. Plant stabilization and mutation rates after number of generations. Several enclosures have been constructed so far. Contain the animals and monitor their progress. One of which is the Animal Enclosure 3 near Crimson Meadow Horticulture Center. Office. I'm sitting right now and writing this soon-to-be article. Through my window I see a herd of blubberous bovinoids grazing on juicy red grass. Soon these majestic creatures will become the first of our artificially evolved animals to be released. In ten years, once the vegetation spreads further and more species introduced become introduced into the wilderness, the cavern will be teeming with life richer than ever. Okay, Phil Bridges, West Storage Depot. Phil Bridges, personal log, LE1310122. Man taught himself how to use tools, to how to make clothes, how to tame fire, and how to express himself through art. Man raised cities, built machines, traversed the world, rose above the clouds, conquered the sky, and invaded the beyond. Man envisaged the future and brought it to the present. Man is without a shadow of a doubt intelligent. But when some men decide to encase a power substation unit in heavy olivet bolt stone that can only be handled by a strong man or some other machinery before a technician like me can perform maintenance, one begins to question this intellectually technological evolution of mankind. Maybe it's not man, mankind that possesses vast striving intellect, but only certain men. It is those men who drive civilizations forward. For one when, when one takes a perfectly functional and reliable set of generator design, decides to decorate it as to the Lemurian style, one should perhaps only apply but should, well, no, one should perhaps apply some common sense and take practicality into consideration. Using more manageable materials, designing the unit, man or two could open it on their own with simple tools. Because today I had to wait three hours for a strong man to finally become available so that I could begin working. Three hours. Other corporations take on the unit less visually attractive than ours. Certainly, some are sinfully repulsive, even... They are all made to be as easy to use and maintain as possible. Always be of primary concern. Even the earlier NFT designs followed this same sensible principle. Current models have a front panel which gives access to most components. But in order to reach the generator core, I need the help of a pair of inhuman hands. And when a strong man in possession of such is unavailable... Wait for three hours. Of course, these kind of delays are unacceptable. Yet there is nothing any one of us is able to do about it. The Lemurian style, forefront of everything. Present in architecture, clothing, vehicle and vessel design, and even the simplest items like box containers, crates and nail clippers. Everything must be pleasing to the eye, even if it doesn't need to. It's wonderful in one sense, for art, Expression, stimulus for the human int intellect and emotion, pure and limitless. Visual art of the highest kind, the exposed female breasts of the most well-endowed kind. As I've already stated, just an expression of the human mind, male mind. Visual elements combined to contribute to the perception that one is truly living in an ideal environment. Known and scientifically proven that in an environment pleasing to the senses, highly positive effect on the human well-being, until one has to perform certain kinds of tasks, that in, is in which case the beauty quickly turns into beast, for longer than three hours must add. Infuriating! first time I've had this happen to me. I have work to do and a specific amount of time allotted to do it. Complications like this are not only an unneeded setback, quite distressing. Just the other day I performed repairs on the medication synthesis unit in the Nexus. Awful application of deco-centric design made me spend many frustrating hours. Frustrating problems. Not the difficulty of a task that is the problem in and of itself. 
but it is the difficulty that could have been avoided entirely had the designer thought of something other than just appearance. However, I suppose the real truth here is that the strongmen are being transferred back and forth in order to prepare our defences. The problems I described never occurred earlier since strongmen were always available. The designer made the units with servants in mind that they would always be aid us. Should he be blamed for it? Which is what am I what is what I am doing now? No, I should not be blaming him. Instead I should be blaming myself for giving in under the pressure of the impending war that could quite possibly mean our doom. Mark Bright, Nexus of Technology. Mark Bright. Hydrothermal vents, article for Lemurian Intelligencer. The existence of hydrothermal vents had been known to humanity for many years before the end of the old era. And while they were well studied in the me mechanisms by which they operate well understood at that time, harnessing difficult challenge and would happen only in the years just before the descent. These vents, fissures in the planet's surface that issue geothermically heated water, primarily found deep below the ocean surface in regions where tectonic plates spread from one another. With the average depth being just over two kilometres, it's clear that the path to exploitation of these rich sources is one laid with some quite imposing obstacles. In addition, some of the other more effective ways of producing energy make pursuing hydrothermal vents as valid energy sources a rather costly and inferior option during the early 21st century of the old era. But the world was changing rapidly in these deleter deleterious times of human existence, but the future was costly. The exploitation of fossil fuels itself fueled political avarice and extermination of millions of the most brutal wars the world. For if food comes before morality, so do hydrocarbon energy sources. The reason? Their finiteness and the growing hunger of a modern society needed to be sated with exponentially more energy. Thus, more and more political entities, big countries or super corporations, were forced to turn to renewable. New Frontier Technologies made it their mission to rely only on renewable energy sources, sunlight, wind waves, geothermal heat if available. It was our saving grace that we had developed some of these technologies to a high degree before the staring into the eyes of the extinction otherwise. One successful NFT project was Lemuria, the world we live in, and it is the inquiry into the exploitation of geothermal sources that has made Lemuria possible. <coughs> in the chaotic final days of the old era, a global investigation has been performed by New Frontier Technologies in order to find suitable locations. Tenebrous Dome Lake, Abundant gashes in the lake bed, the relative seclusion, relative meaning that under rail is still not too far away, spacious the caverns and thriving underwater, to terrestrial life, all further attributed to. Richness in life is precisely the product of these hydrothermal vents, because the energy and precipitation of the minerals from the vents support the chemosynthetic bacteria, which are in turn being consumed by larger organisms, and the food chain continues from there. The relatively small depth of the vents made harnessing energy from them a simple task for NFT, so sensibly all facilities were and still are being powered by hydrothermal energy. This natural decentralisation of power sources. Each facility had to have its own generator. Granted, LIT4U AVAC transformers have been installed to transfer energy between facilities in case of emergency, but these ended up being used rarely, the most notable case being the power failure at Lemco in LE21. The generators that we, that we used LX SCRC 70U supercritical Kestrel style generators, uh, cycle generators that designed specifically, installed at the base of each facility stop atop their respective hydrothermal vent. Each facility is equipped with power substation units, singular devices based on old set of power step generators. These units are directly connected to the primary generators, performing a variety of functions such as regulating distribution, electrical current conversion, and backup generation reason why the set of design was used as the basis for the unit. The vents themselves range between 200 and 400 degrees centigrade in temperature with some of them providing in excess of 50 megawatt tons. Whereas the generators themselves were designed to last for more than 200 years. The estimate for dry versions, aka not underwater, is about 250 years, which convincingly relates how well designed and coded the U versions have become at that particular time. I'll conclude my article here. As I've already mentioned, there are more reasons why hydrothermal vents have proven useful to us. The minerals being precipitated and collected are processed and processed, and the biota being supported by the vents, and the tall smokers and corals make up for stunning landscape, 
which grasps the viewer and doesn't let go. I will leave elaboration of these, however, to someone more competent in their respect in their respective subjects. Okay, Edda Feller. Dr. Edda Feller, Dr. Mason's transformation. I'm the only one left unchanged, and soon I'll be the only one left alive. About 20 minutes ago, Biocorp released more of those gas-dispersing bots into the ventilation system, and Dr. Mason's been affected. Toby and I managed to lure him into the mortuary. And Toby, I locked Dr. Mason inside. I can observe him via the surveillance system. The oxygen tank. And I have only one to spare. The only thing I can do right now is watch. First hour since explosion. So far, all those who were affected with the mutagen have displayed high levels of aggression, and Dr. Mason is no exception. He quickly turned violent following the explosion and gouged out one of the patient's eyes through the gas mask. While Dr. Mason is indeed an imposing and strong man, such unbelievable strength is nothing else but a result of his mutation. Unresponsive to external pain, yet his constant alteration between screaming and sobbing. Pain he has already feels easily overpowers all external stimuli. His outbursts are truly horrifying. Heard through the thick walls. Second now since exposure. Whereas Dr. Mason was at mo first mostly unchanged physically by the mutation, if we discard his increased strength, better muscle fibre activation, the consequences become more easily noticeable. He appears thinner, as though he's lost a lot of weight, and on his skin greenish growths. Hair is falling off as well. Behaviour. Has mauled every corpse he could find. Calmed down a bit. He stopped screaming, but his sobbing still echoes through the mortuary. I won't lie, I can, I can barely... laying my eyes on that monitor. And I wish I could just escape this nightmare. But effort requires oxygen. And I'm on my last tank. Third hour since exposure. He's staring at the camera. Doing that for the past 20 minutes. In silence, his body... continuing to change, most notably his osseous structure. Nails have fallen off while his distal phalanxes have grown nearly twice in size, protruding through the flesh and turning into claws. The whole body is deforming. Where the skin is so stretched, it's close to tearing. Other than that, the growths appear to be more green and that there is more of them. But those eyes, it just keeps staring. Fourth hour since exposure. He's calling for me. I can hear him clearly. He's staring at me. He knows I'm here. He knows I'm here. Fifth hour since exposure. He's different from the others. By now everyone else would have had their cognitive abilities irreversibly reduced to bestial levels. Capable of constructing fairly complex sentences and articulating them clearly. Talking about how painful it is. Wants this to stop called out to me. Beg me to help him. How does he know I'm watching? High psionic potential? Factor that somehow affects the mutation? Physical change in the last two hours has been dramatic. Pretty much unrecognisable. His skin is covered in some kind of oil, and it looks like his body is secreting it. Clearly see the muscles underneath. They've gotten severe scoliosis, forcing him to walk, walk abnormally, abnormally, and with great difficulty. It's clear that his bones are continuing to deform. Six hours since exposure, he turned violent again. The skin began peeling off. In great pain, screaming and banging on the gate. He wants me to let him go. I can't bear this any more. I have to leave. Mason, forgive me. I can hear him screaming. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. I can see him. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He is everywhere. It hurts. Delightful. So, Lisa Jackson. Lisa H. Jackson. First draft of Naga Protectors. Note, think of a better name. Article for Lemurian Intelligence. Today they've been fully, uh, finally unveiled. The Naga Protectors, named after the mythical creatures of the old era. Pinnacle of Lemurian engineering. 
embodiment of the Lemurian style. But first, I would like to start at the very beginning. Note, expand the intro a little bit. Even before the descent, the six supercomputer corporations always had different paradigms when it came to robotic design and development, often with completely opposite goals. First example, the BioCorp view of robots is nothing more than mere autonomous tools, so they designed them all accordingly. They were limited to little or no interactivity with humans. They were to be fairly simple in shape, rather cubic for the most part, as to facilitate mass production. Lack any and all decorative features, with abilities strictly confined to the domain of their work. Some of them were made for security, some for heavy lifting, and some were modular. All of them were made as one would make a tool. Need nothing more. Whereas Bionic Institute viewed things a bit differently. Their ultimate goal was to merge humans and machines, flesh and metal, grow and man grown and manufactured. It was natural that of their robots were viewed as more than just simple tools to be used and discarded once they're no longer useful considered members of their society, equal, as much as possible at least, to those who made them. They were being developed to be intelligent and sentient, to think, feel and dream, love even, and where artificial met its limits, natural was used to augment it and vice versa. That was how they viewed it and that was how they did it, the exact opposite of Biocorp. Note, new synonyms for viewed, it repeats a lot. Next example, security agency. They built machines for war. Innumerable series of warbots have been produced and perfected. Some even manufactured by other greater warbots that were designed to continuously output new machines no matter the, th the theatre or threat they were in. Ranged from the cheapest and simplest, like D-drones or the RX-5s, the cybernetic foot soldiers, largest and most destructive, the dreaded orbital devastators, capable of eradicating their enemies from the edge of the thermosphere, with precision and merciless no living creatures could ever achieve. Responsible for millions of deaths alone. Built to obey and destroy, and they were used by the SA themselves, but also by anyone else who could afford them. Note, add... Warbots never had... Markings. New frontier technology. We made ours to construct, to raise, to manufacture, to terraform. To serve not only their owners, but humanity and the environment. Wherever humanity could and would go. Appropriate robots could and would follow. The Earth's orbit. The deepest point in the ocean. Isolated underground cavern. We developed our robots for the environment. The basic paradigm remained unchanged wherever we are. This paragraph is a lot shorter than the others, but I suppose NFT does not need much explanation. So we came to Lemuria. Our needs here in this underground world completely different than they were in the place where we could look at the sky and the sun. Absence of the sun has made a huge impact on the Mirian style. Talking about this is... We had the technology to survive and change the world, but there was nothing beautiful down here. It's all water and dirt, darkness and no matter. Terraform, even if we one day surround ourselves with grass and forests, would never replace the lack of a shining sun. The oldest few among us still remember it, but even those who've never seen it do miss it. Note, shorten the section, the sun part's a bit rambly. Turned into water motives. Sensibly, it was the primary source of inspiration. Absence of the sun. The distinct Lemurian style developed quickly. Among other things, this gave birth to the servants, based upon the long standing helpers which literally build our facilities. The servants were improved in all aspects. Note, remove the sun part and merge this with the previous paragraph. Still could use a few more lines on the Lemurian style, however. Functionality wise, they were adapted to operating in this specific environment. Just a few examples. Solar cells for emergency powering were remove, removed for obvious reasons. Electric actuators were upgraded from A900 to A910WP, waterproof version designed for Lemuria. Sensitive components were as well replaced with more suitable variants. AI has been upgraded to allow the servants to swim and perform other actions whilst partially or fully submerged. Note, don't need more examples, already elaborated on that in the previous article. Major changes was the way the servants are being stored. Instead of being stacked in tubular pods and moved out of sight, servants would retire to olivate pedestals, which would recharge them. Blend in with the other purely decorative statues. Pedestals charge them by means of electromagnetic induction, so the top surface is nice and flat. Note, nice and flat? Having servants rest in the hallways, 
as I now have benefited them being more easily available. Their idleness served. Aesthetic purpose. The Zealot stone proved too heavy for the servants. A special kind of coating was developed to give their skin an appearance indistinguishable from olive oil. This coating is slowly reducing the use of olive oil globally, but that is a wholly different subject. Note, should I in there somewhere, this coating is called OC40. <coughs> Excuse me. For years, these improved helpers, the servants, have served, have served as well. No, I should rephrase that. It sounds silly to me reading it now. The community thrived. Our technology became more advanced. It cannot forever remain in isolation, and that someday all that we have built here will come under severe threat. We are not a security agency. We should not be defenceless. The recent militarization project of the Joint Security Command. Terrestrial Guardian robot equipped with heavy weaponry. It would also serve an aesthetic function similar to that of the servants. The same pedestal-based recharging type of surface coating were to be used, with perhaps slight modifications. That's where the similarities end, for the Naga protectors are not here to do heavy lifting, or to prepare our meals. Kill our opponents. The new LZZ-2 fusion cannons, which proved easily surpass any other weapon we possess when it comes to raw destructive power. Capable of eliminating pretty much all targets short of T-12 rated armoured vehicles in a single hit. What else is more fitting to carry such a weapon than the largest of our servants, or should I say protectors? Cannons are installed inside the protector's mouth and are completely concealed until engagement. The first two units unveiled today have been posted in the Nexus Technologies courtyard. We will be seeing more and more. They will be sitting atop their pedestal so that we may marvel at their beauty. But when danger finally draws near, rise and glow so that we may marvel at their might. Final note, the text is too long. I should have cut something or split this into two articles or else Alexander will never accept this. Montgomery Vincent. Security Commander Vincent Montgomery. Mirian Defence Warlog, LE-1810-122. Nothing can be seen from our position due to thick black and green smoke coming from the direction of the Citadel of Life. Plenty can still be heard. The siege continues, even though our forces have neutralised roughly, including their siege submarine. The primary threat is still active. The directed energy destroyer. Despite the fact that disabled the destroyer's shield and inflicted considerable, still capable of ceaseless combat activity. Reports say the Citadel's residential and cultural sectors decimated. Currently attacking the commercial sector. I have no active security marines to oppose them, but few remaining ones going JSHQ and the evacuated civilians within. Some minor skirmishes have been reported in. Nothing has happened here since yesterday's shelling. It appears that almost all Biocorp vessels are fighting alongside the destroyer, with a few aforementioned exceptions in addition to two unmanned vessels, patrolling near JSHQ. Arch Island Keep. Lemco and the Citadel of Life are the only Lemurian centres which have been involved in the heavy fighting so far. Other positions saw no other fighting at all, or even if they did, it resulted in a small number of casualties and damage to the equipment and buildings. Evident that large exposed centres like Lemco and the Citadel of Life are easy targets. So far, none of the underground or underwater facilities have been entered by Biocorp forces, but the report from Arch Island keep the use of toxic gas. Little hope regarding the security of these facilities. I never imagined such a thought would even appear, let alone solidify in my mind, but there is no hope. It's over. When Biocorp finally does annihilate everything on the surface, they will either gas those who nutrient assemblers, oxygen generation, and water purification systems can support the majority of facilities. Ventilation systems. Anyone emerges, they'll be eliminated. Biocorp has given us no reason to assume otherwise. If only we'd invested more effort and resources into our security, and if only the earthquake had, which destroyed the arch revealed our existence to the world never happened. Things would have turned out differently, perhaps. Who am I writing this final report to? If you're reading this, I'm already dead. If you're a Biocorp soldier, I hope you and your kind burns until the end of time for what you've done. If not, then know that there used to be a whole world here with its inhabitants fought bravely to preserve it. Security Commander. Osborne Benedict. Crimson Meadow Horticulture Center. Benedict Osborne. Crimson Meadow, article for Lemuria Intelligencer. The world once we came used to be green, not because of toxic chemicals or olive oil stone architecture, but because of plants. Freely and wildly, and they covered the surface of the old world, the plants got everything they needed from a luminous celestial called the sun. Some of them stayed close to the ground, some twined up taller plants clinging to them for dear life, but as their tall and firm ones rose, sometimes lived for centuries, 
These ones, trees, we don't see anymore. The size or shape, all of them needed the sun. The sun still exists, but its light no longer reaches us because of that no plants grow underground. But species of fungi not need the sun to grow. We will not be talking about fungi in this article, but only plants. We cannot make our own sun per se, but we can, however, substitute it. One needs only light. There are differences in what kind of light it is. Of course, for instance, strong ultraviolet light causes the plants to create antioxidants in order to protect themselves from photo damage. And these antioxidants increase their nutritional value. Coloured light, say red, performs far worse than blue light at maximising photosynthesis. Because the waves we perceive as being red lie on the lower frequency spectrum of visible light. And therefore carry less energy. Let us start with simple white light, which contains... It is it's simple to produce anyway. UV light. We have the hydrothermal vents to drive our generators and create power. We can use that power to create light. We have the sun now. But what about the plants? There are many kinds of plants. Some plants are called Streptophyta. And these are the land plants, the most common. Also things like Chlorophyta. These are green algae. There are others. Some have seeds which carry the plants, embryos and food. Uh, but some don't and instead have mobile gametes that can fuse together far away from the plant parental plants. Whereas others have spores which do not fuse at all to create new plants. To grow plants in Lemuria, we bought plenty of seeds, gametes and spores. But many different species, all sealed to last for centuries. We have our sun and our plants. What else do we need? Some need ground for minerals. We have that. Oxygen as well. Plants need water and those that do not live near water need rain. Water falling from above. Large masses of condensed water vapour floating high above. We will make our rain if, that's what, if that is what we... Have everything now, and the plants are growing. Do you see a problem? No. In the old era, living creatures, or at least a majority of them, did not need our care to survive. In fact, plants are older than humans, as are many other living. They existed before us. We as Lemurians, as new frontier technology, we mustn't forget that our mission... Life possible where it shouldn't be. Environment thrive alongside us. We can grow plants in our closed gardens and our hydroponic chambers, but that is not environment. Environment is outdoors, is the old saying. The team and I were responsible for creating plants that could flourish in the dim caverns. They do not need our sun and our rain, or us at all. First, we looked at their colour. Not all were green, but most of them were, at least when it came to the parts of the plant in which photosynthesis occurred. Why? Because the sun provided too much energy, so plants that absorbed it all get burned. That is why now plants are black which would be their colour if they had the ability to absorb all wavelengths. So the plants are green because they absorb blue and red light, reflecting what is left of the visible light spectrum green. Chlorophyll is the actual pigment which allows photosynthesis in these kind of plants. It's proven to be the most successful solution. In but not here. Here we need that piece of the light spectrum. We've tried creating these black plants at first, but they had a problem even in limited light. Fine, normally, but shining even moderately bright light on them would cause them death. That was not a permanent solution. Purple plants absorbed too little light, because they, had not, no, because they had normally lived in areas that offered them too much of it. Then we took a look at some of the non-green plants and why. The algae that live deep in massive bodies of water, oceans, were red because red light didn't penetrate far enough through the water. So the algae absorbed everything but red light, which essentially means it got reflected back. Genetically modified through numerous iterations, many species of existing plants to have red pigment. This proved to be the thing we were looking for, the perfect balance of colour for our world. Two species of water reeds and three of grasses were among our first successes. The water reeds first spread beyond the range of our light towers and took on a life of their own. Then the grasses. We're constantly developing new species to dimness, giving them the green that they had been giving us, to us, but soon they'll be able to adapt on their own. One day we might... trees. This is not the end. <coughs> Excuse me. This is not the end of our work. New challenges await us, and there is so much to be done. But the most important thing is that we have managed to create at least a crimson meadow in this gloomy underworld. Not our meadow, meadow, no. For we wanted to exist even if we ceased to. Finally, George Power, Arch Island Keep. George Power, LE 1710, 122. Dear Father, right now as I'm writing this, the Biocorp Navy is clearing the arch tunnel which we had collapsed in order to slow down their advance. Sadly, they're doing so with great efficiency. Floater mines will buy us some more time, but that time will quickly run out. 
Our glide is a patrol in the island per parameter. Fellow security marines are boarding the carriers. Plasma cannons are being blank charged and aimed at the arch. Servants have been brought to help all set up all of our static defences. And Naga. Me, I'm sitting in my bunker with my dear friends and comrades in arms, Clive Mitchell and Angus Hall, waiting for the looming battle. I've already written to Julia and I've written to Mum. Now I'm writing to you. But you are the most difficult one to write to, for a simple reason. I know you'll not be reading this. Yet I still need to type in these words, because if I don't do it now, I might never get another chance. You are never a man of patience, so I'll keep this as brief as possible. What we're doing today is defending our future, just like you. Father, I too have passed security. Proud. And I know that if you were able to, you would, you too would be with me in this bunker, blaster in hand and teeth ready to chew through each and every biocorp soldier's neck if need be. We'd be side by side, one. But you're not here. You're not alive anymore. Despite 15 years of absence, there is still a way for us to fight together. It's through me. Because I am you. I used to think that if it wasn't, weren't for family pictures, videos or holograms, I'd forget you. Forget how you looked and sounded and behaved. But now I know I need only look in the mirror and I'll see you every time. Father, the time is nigh. Join me in battle and let us show those wicked fiends. Okay. Wow. That took a while. And because of that, this is going to be the entire episode. Um, when you see this, it will be as a addition to the normal schedule. So there will be three episodes in whichever week this is released. Um, it will be on a Wednesday if it's a... If it falls in the middle of a Tuesday or a Thursday one, if not, it'll probably be on a Friday or at the weekend. As I will not wish to bore you for that, I will also add a note to the front end of the episode to say that this is a reedy episode. So, when we next come back, uh, I will be talking to... I will go and have a look and see if I can find um, the military guy, whose name I have forgotten right now. And if I can find him, then we'll start there. If not, I will go back to the base that we just were and I will find out there. Anyway, thank you ever so much for watching. If you've enjoyed my reading here, please subscribe. If not, do not worry about it. We will be back with a bit more action next time. Thank you again. Goodbye.